Hey everyone, sorry for leaving you hanging like that in part one. We're going to get right into part two, but just a quick summary of what happened in part one. There was a creeper breaking into homes for a few years at this point. They would steal underwear mostly to begin with. They recorded themselves doing these things. There were two assaults on Cozy Cove, uh, one of Jane and one of Lori. There were also strange break-ins in the town surrounding Tweed. It wasn't just in that one community that these things happened. Sadly, very tragically, we had two murders of Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Cumeau. The man was getting sloppy. He was leaving behind DNA. He wasn't as careful. His footprints, his tire tracks, in fact, were helping the police catch up to whoever this person was. And we have to remember the, the time that this all occurred, there wasn't this easy way to communicate town to town. So this went on for a while. Uh, there were a couple of close calls like when the police officer knocked on the door and he was right in the backyard. But ultimately, he was not caught for a while. Now, at the time where we're going to pick up, Jessica Lloyd is still missing. They don't know where she is. So they had done a traffic stop. And during that traffic stop, a resident of Cozy Cove, the colonel, from the 437 transport squadron pulls up he talks to the officers and he goes on about his day three days later he gets a phone call now keep in mind at this point the rumors are still out there about larry from cozy cove who is russell's neighbor right so he gets this phone call and he's asked to come down to the station to have a phone call with a detective, Jim Smith. And he's more than willing and happy to go and help in whatever way that he can. He kisses his wife and says, you know, I should be back soon. They have some questions and I'm going to go down and answer them. Before we get into the interrogation, I did want to give you some history like we did with the other residents on Russell and Mary Elizabeth. Now, Russell was the colonel. He was very well respected, but not really well known because he was always working. He was extremely busy overseeing the military base and his wife worked for the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And she was not an in Cozy Cove as much as Russell was. So we're going to kind of start at the beginning so you can get an idea of who they were. Russell was born on May 7th, 1963, in the Midlands region of England to David and Christine. His family moved when he was young to Chalk River, Ontario, which wasn't really a town of great importance, except it had a nuclear plant where his dad worked. So his dad worked there, and often they would get together with other families whose parents worked there. And one of the families that they would often get together with were the, I'm going to totally butcher this name, Sofkas, S-O-V-K-A-S, Jerry and Lynn Sofkas, right? So those two families were close, Christine and David, Russell's parents, and Lynn and Jerry, because Jerry also worked there. They would do things like hang out at the yacht club and have dinghy races on the river and they would go to dinner and they would have drinks and parties. It was, it was upscale and the families were close. They all got along very well, but in 1969, Christine filed for divorce from Russell's dad, David. And she cited in the court documents that the reason was adultery. Christine claimed that David was having an affair with their good friend, Jerry's wife, Lynn. But that's not all. Allegedly, Christine was having an affair with Jerry. So she cited adultery. She got a divorce. So Russell's parents break up. Here we go. Christine marries 
Jerry and David and Lynn get together. David and Lynn's relationship doesn't really last, but Christine and Jerry would remain together for several decades. Christine even had the boys, Russell and Harvey was the other brother, take Jerry's last name. And Russell was about seven years old at this time. So still young enough not to be completely devastated. I'm sure he was very upset, but they went on to have a very good life. Russell was very gifted when it came to music as well as his studies, but music was a passion of his. It was something that he loved very much. So he spent a lot of time practicing his music. He was in the band in school and not like, oh, you're in the band, but it was a highly regarded band. Um, they traveled to places, South Korea for a year while his stepfather was helping to build a nuclear plant there. When they returned, the boys were put into a very prestigious boarding school, uh, the Upper Canada College, it was called. And they did well there. You know, Christine was the kind of mom who wanted her boys to have the best. Uh, she was snobbish. I will say that she was snobbish, but she did want them to associate with the right people. She wanted them around the right people. She wanted them to take their studies seriously. And Russell did. He attended the university, university of Scarborough, Toronto, Scarborough. And he quickly earned this reputation for being very studious. He was serious. He wasn't a jokester. He wasn't like a frat guy. He wasn't getting drunk. He was studying. Um, so some people saw him as off-putting. He was snobbish. You know, he was the guy who even on school vacations, Russell was studying. He was still on the campus. He wasn't going home. So he did meet his very best friend, Jeff. And Jeff was probably one of the people closest to Russell throughout the rest of his life. Uh, they always stayed in touch. But midway through his first year, something changed a bit. Maybe it was the addition of Jeff who brought out the fun side of Russ. I don't know. But he became a prankster for a while, him and Jeff together. They would run down the hallways laughing and banging on pots and pans and leading other people through the halls laughing and singing and just being silly, being college students. There was one story that stuck out. Well, there were a couple, but a manager in one of the areas of the college walks into her office and everything is missing. There's nothing there. But the room's filled with crumpled white paper. So she walks into her office and she's looking around like, what in the world? And she hears something behind her and she turns around and it's Russell. And he snaps a photo of her reaction. And she's like, Russell, do you have nothing better to do with your time than fill my office with paper? And he's like, no, I don't. <laughs> It just walks away. Okay, then. So he was a prankster now. You know, he got great joy. Him and him and Jeff did get a lot of joy. They would wrap toilet seats, you know, with like saran wrap. So you'd like stick to them and stuff. And they did a lot of things. They would hide in closets or under the bed and wait and wait and wait for their friends to be really into their studies or doing something else. And then they would pop out and scare them half to death. <laughs> and they enjoyed it. They just thought that it was great. He had one relationship during his college years to a young girl from Japan. And she was also very into her studies to the point where she didn't really get to spend a lot of time with Russ which, you know, she was the boss in the relationship too. She made their dates. She said when they could see each other, she determined all of that. And nothing to her was more important than her studies, not even Russ. So when the relationship ultimately ended after a couple of years, he was devastated. He was extremely upset. And he wouldn't even talk about it with Jeff, who was his best friend. So 
eventually in 1986, he graduates and his degree is in economics and political science. But to everybody's surprise, he says, I'm going to go into the Air Force. Now, right before all of this was, you know, the breakup and all of that. And Russ became obsessed with watching the movie Top Gun. I have a need for speed. You know what I'm talking about, Tom Cruise. Hey, Mavericks. Yeah. You hear about ice? What's that? You want another one? Really? Yeah. I feel the need. The need for speed. Ow! And they thought, you know, he's watching this Top Gun. Now he's going into the Air Force. Is, she, is he trying to win the girl? And they really thought, you know, that was his plan. And maybe it was. Maybe it was just something he became enamored with and thought, you know, this will get her back. But, you know, he ends up going and joining the military. And he joins the Canadian forces. In the same year that he joins, he ends up meeting his future wife. And her name is Mary Elizabeth. So this was 1990. He earns his wings. Uh, He joins in 86. He leaves. Then he ends up joining. Then he meets Mary Elizabeth. And then in 1990, he gets his wings. May not get the dates screwed up there. Russ was a dedicated human being. Okay. He would drive back and forth. One way was eight hours to go see Mary Elizabeth. That's how much she meant to him. Eight hours? One way? I don't think I know anybody who likes me that much. Eight hours to spend a few hours and then have to drive back eight hours? He loved her. So their relationship was wonderful. They, all, they enjoyed the same thing. They were into good eating, being healthy, gardening music and she was very bright she was also a military kid her dad held positions in the military so they got along great uh she went on to earn her mba she worked for the heart and stroke foundation her family really liked russell you know uh the dad enjoyed the fact that he was also in the military So they gave their permission for their daughter to be married, and they were in 1991. Early on, the two decided not to have kids. It just wasn't something they envisioned, you know, bringing a child into a crazy world. So they got a cat, and the cat's name was Curious, and they called him Curio. And then they eventually got another cat named Rosebud as well. But they treated these cats much like I treat my dogs. It's part of the family. This is another child. It's not just, you know, a cat that you let outside and it, you know, forges for itself. And no, it's your baby. It's in the house with you. This is your responsibility. And they very much treated Curio like that. So now they have Curio and he ends up promoted He is a complete shining star in the military. He is moving fast. In 1999, he's promoted to the rank of major and he serves there. And then in 2004, he earns his master's degree uh, for defense studies. And he's promoted in 2004 to the lieutenant colonel and appointed to commanding officer at 437 Transport Squadron in Ontario. Sorry, I have to keep notes on that. There are so many dates. He held so many positions. He was flying. Everybody admired this guy. You know, he just was, he was what you would want as far as a leader in your military. So between 2005 and 2009, he holds several different positions. He ends up becoming the colonel. He's part of welcoming the Olympics there. And he's just doing wonderfully. But the base, he ends up being assigned to the base that's three hours away from their home. And they decide to purchase the little waterfront 
bungalow cottage in the town of Tweed. So Russ would stay there, as I told you guys in the beginning. And, you know, Monique would come up at Monique. Monique is the neighbor, but Mary's the wife. Let's not get confused here. She would come up and they would do all the things, you know, they would garden and play cribbage with Ron and Monique next door and their daughter. And, you know, they were just happy. They had a really good life. Uh, In 2005, he was injured, though, in Dubai, and he developed this chronic back pain that just was debilitating some of the time. He began to take some pain medication, prescription pain medication. And one of the medications was prednisone, which is a steroid, like an an inflammation and steroid. Uh, I've the only reference that I personally have to prednisone is that my dog takes it because of the extreme inflammation in his ears. But in any case, this is what they prescribed him. And one of the things Russell would do at nighttime is jog. And he said that the pressure of that movement would take that pressure off of his back and it would sometimes help, but it was getting to the point where even that was not helping. And he considered retiring early. Um, He and his friend, you know, the next door neighbors, Ron and Monique, they would often sit and have card games, but there came a point in time where Russell would just have to stand. He couldn't sit down. It was making him crazy, the pain in his back. So that was happening for a couple of years. Then in 2007, their cat Curio died. And they, she had to be put to sleep. And it was extremely difficult for Russell and Mary. They were just, you know, they were devastated. Who wants to put their pet to sleep? And a lot of people, you know, they, Russell was devastated by his mother and stepfather's divorce. And now, you know, he's putting his cat to sleep. Mary's mother had passed on as well. So there was a lot going on around this time. In any case, now you're kind of caught up to who they were. You've got the Colonel, you've got the Heart and Stroke Foundation executive, They're friends with their neighbors. Everybody's happy. They're gardening. They're doing all of the things. But all of this crazy stuff is happening right on their very street and in town surrounding them. So they're very concerned about what is going on. So Detective Jim Smith ends up calling Russell to see if he can help them in any way. And Russell arrives around 3 p.m. to meet with the detective, and he's eager to assist. What can I do? You know, and Jim Smith, the, the person that Russell ends up speaking with, he is not a demanding force. He's not intimidating. When you meet him, you're not thinking, you know, I'm in the box. I'm in, I'm in trouble now. Uh, he's very welcoming, calming presence. And I'm going to put some of that in here so that you can see. Very mild. You just have a seat there, Russell. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was, was Russ as well. Oh, yeah. And he took, uh, took every number I had. Yeah. Now, they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. Right. Glad to see it. Um, just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone just okay. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, <sighs> You ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? Or? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh no? Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. I guess the closest to interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh yeah. Very mild mannered, very competent. The formalities of the introductions go down, and the detective speaks to Russell about the crimes. That are being committed in his very area. Our approach to cases like this is yes. that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm-hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So, um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with, mm-hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, 
Sure. So, uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today, okay? okay. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or well, not, but I didn't guy. want to drink yeah. in front of you, so. No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, Started your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Piece, piece of gum <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe- everybody with respect. I don't mm-hmm. want to ask if they do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Lloyd is... Um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating. Okay, right. um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts, yeah. okay? Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance, mm-hmm. okay? So essentially, when you're looking at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. Right. Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm-hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm-hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement. Okay. And uh, so, what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly, when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses. Okay. Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else. Absolutely. Right. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm-hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and okay. uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Okay. Um, do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. no, I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm-hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm-hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today. Okay. Okay. And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person of authority, mm-hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So. No, understood. Um, and the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that, uh, you know, you mentioned a f- second ago about uh, Ms. Como. Um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things, um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases, um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm-hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? okay. But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being yeah. recorded, right? So, um, I understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a, uh, a door-to-door. And, yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night, so I spoke with a couple of guys then. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from uh, looking at the different cases. 
And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, okay? Um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? And Russell explains, yes, you know, I know all about them. I've heard all about what is going on. I'm concerned. And they ask him, well, where were you on January 29th? And he explained he stayed home. He had a stomach flu and left around 9 p.m. to go sleep at the base for an early morning flight to California. He asked if Russell knew Marie France, which was one of his subordinates. And he had only met her one time. And it was a she was on a crew that he was part of back when he started at the base. So it's not as though they really knew each other, but he had seen her. He also had contacted her family via letter to offer condolences for her death. So the detective asks him, what would you be willing to do to, you know, let us move past you? You know, since you knew Marie, you live on Cozy Cove and you pass by Jessica's house. You know, that's a lot of stuff. And uh, he's like, anything, of course, anything. What, what do you need? Do you need my DNA? What do you need? And I'm happy to give it to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton or had you flown? No, away? I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa earlier in the week. Uh, for some meetings over in, uh, in Gatineau for one of the, um, especially for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week, again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. So if we were to uh, to you know do a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Yeah. Uh, um, I th you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in our investigation, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to, uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch, uh, I prefer Law & Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally, yes. Okay. So you have an idea of, obviously, the forensic capabilities, things like that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What, uh, what do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's what we're going we're gonna to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now, we have a process we have to go through to do that. <laughs> and Russell asks him, you know, is this going to be handled discreetly? Because if the base hears that I'm in here being questioned at all over this, it could have a significant impact on my career. And he tells him, of course, you know, of course, that's why you're down here on a Sunday. We're not trying to make a spectacle out of this situation, which was very respectful. I mean, he is the colonel after all. So can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military is certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Ms. Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. So the question goes on several hours. And each date that Russell was questioned about, he had an alibi for. So no problem. The detective and Russell speak again, uh, and he brings up tire tracks. And he tells Russell, you know, there were tire tracks behind Jessica Lloyd's house. And they match your tires, Russell. What kind of tires do you have on your pathfinder? 
I think um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name or sorry the uh, I think make? Is, uh, um, I don't. Know. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. I'll read this off to you. See if it rings a bell. Ever heard of uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds make any right. sense? Yeah. Okay. When did you have those tires put on your Pathfinder? Well, it's the second version we've had of them, so uh, I think it might have been this past fall. They replaced other ones we've had on the same. Okay. Well, Toyo, I can't say that they were the same, exactly the same model, but uh, our dealership here in Ottawa says they're very popular for the Pathfinders. So okay. And they were good. They lasted a long time. All right. Um, I've had to, I think you were talking about the, the whole idea of the MPs uh, helping us with our investigation, mm -hmm. stuff like this. You have the same system as we do at our headquarters with the swipe cards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, one of our investigators did is they made a call while I was talking to you there um, because we were trying to work through that week of the, uh, the 23rd of November. Okay. Um, 23rd being the Monday, uh, 24th being the Tuesday. Okay. Um, what, what, they've, what they've told us is that, um, and I want to make sure I get this right, is that uh, on the 23rd, uh, your swipe card was being used at the base. Okay. okay. Uh, on Tuesday, 24th, there was no use of your swipe card. Okay. okay? And then on the uh, the following days, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, there was what appeared to be average activity of your yeah. swipe card on the base. Does that make sense to you? It does. That that says that I was in Ottawa on the Tuesday. Okay. Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? Yeah, I was in Gatineau with, uh, as I said, meeting about the uh, C-17. Okay. Um, now, again, I want to be fair to you here. We're going back two months. Yeah. Um, are you sure that would have been the, uh, the day you were in Ottawa? Well, only because I wasn't at the base. Okay. So I, I can't remember, honestly, that that's the day I had the meeting in Ottawa, but uh, if I wasn't at the base, it was because I was here. Okay. Now, if that is the day you had a meeting in Ottawa, um, do you remember being at the base on the Monday, uh, the 23rd, and swiping your card in and out? Do you remember what you would have done that evening to, to, to get to Ottawa for that meeting? Like, would it be... Uh, I drove to Ottawa in the morning of the day of my meeting, so if it was the Tuesday, then I would have left uh, Tweed. It was a very foggy morning okay. uh, that morning. And I drove in that morning. Okay. So I would not have been at the base uh, the day I was in Ottawa because the meeting started at 8.30 or something. Okay, so you leave the base, you would have went home to, to your residence in Tweed. Yep. And then you left Tweed in the morning and drove up to your meeting in Ottawa. Yep. Okay. Um, you leave the, the meeting in Ottawa, is a daytime meeting, evening meeting, or do you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, a daytime meeting, finished, I don't know, mid-afternoon or so. Okay. We had lunch and then uh, finished. I think uh, my wife and I had dinner because she was here for work and then I headed back. Okay. Um, well, that's, these are the kind of things I'm trying to draw out here. That's helpful to us. Um, do you remember where you had dinner? <laughs> uh, well, I don't remember exactly the restaurant, but it was in Westboro because that's where our house was being built at the time. So we had dinner, you know, in a restaurant that we would expect to be able to frequent uh, once the house was finished. Okay. Remember how you paid? Uh, one of us would have paid by MasterCard. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you sure about that? Or Pretty sure. That's normally how we, uh, okay. we pay for meals. All right. I can't and remember if it was me or my wife that paid, but one of us. Okay. And do you remember which restaurant it was again? No. Okay. All right. And you see what I'm getting at, right? I mean, th that can be very helpful for us because yeah. if we can track yeah. uh, that issue, right? Uh, right? We can we can put somebody paying for a, a meal at a, at a location. Well, I was meeting with uh, you know 15 people or so that day. So. Okay. And what time did the meeting end? I would say between three and four. Okay. And um, are you sure that that's the same day you went out with your wife? Well, I think so. Yeah, because she was here and. Uh, I think that was the day we went to this restaurant in Westbury, yes. Okay. Um, you finished dinner, and do you remember what you did that evening? I would have driven back to Tweed. Okay. And you would have... Now, again, I, I know we're talking two months ago here, but do you yeah. remember specifically having dinner and then driving back to Tweed, or uh, do you remember... Uh, are you just guessing here? No, I'm not really guessing. I mean, I, I believe that this night at this restaurant was following the meetings in Ottawa, mm -hmm. and I you know, kissed my wife goodbye and headed back to Tweed. To go to work the next day. Okay. Um, all right. The uh, the tires that you have on your truck, right? The reason I asked you about that is there is there any time? I mean, uh, you recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so of that was? Your house. That was your house. Yeah. Okay. Do so you remember that location? Yep. Yeah. Do you remember what the crossroad was? Or I don't think there was a crossroad. It's sort of just uh, on the south end of thirty seven. Okay. Um, when you get stopped at that location. Has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all? Um, 
for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So yeah, yeah. is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of the roadway? No, that's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway, and I'm just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to, uh, no, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Um, would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property, uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property? Um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. Okay. Um, they took, uh, they examined those tire tracks mm -hmm. and uh, they have contacts in the tire business. Obviously, mm -hmm. tire tracks mm -hmm. are a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, shortly after, um, this investigation started, they identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the other, uh, one of the other things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They, they talk to witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field up to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house. Uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay. okay. Maybe consistent with other things, but consistent yeah. with a Pathfinder. Um, and they, uh, what they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because different vehicles, different makes models have wheelbase width. So yeah. they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, yeah. okay, and determine what the uh, the width is. Sure. And then they can enter that into a vehicle database and it will spit out the types of vehicles. Yeah. Okay. Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very very close to the width of the uh, of the tires uh, that were left in that field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, I was not off the road. No. Okay. All right. Russell, um, is there anything you can think of? Let's go talk about Marie France Como for a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that? During our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No. No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent you know one flight together talking. I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I, I, if that's the case, that's a, that's very surprising. Okay. All right. Now, is seeming concerned at this point because they're getting very specific on these tire tracks and he's quiet for a while. And soon the detective brings in the shoe prints that Russell just gave, right? And then remember there were shoe prints leading from the door to the back of the property. And he places those down in front of Russell. And he says, you know, these are kind of like fingerprints because Yours match. They match. These match, Russ. Russell's like, well, that's very concerning, isn't it? <laughs> it's very concerning. What does that mean exactly? Here, uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, approached you here, okay, uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm -hmm. okay. But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay. And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay. And I want I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right. This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yep. okay. All right. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay. Okay. All right. That's not to scale. That's the footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch. Okay. okay. But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm gonna move this over so you can see what I mean. All right. Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, 
Um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, yeah. okay? This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like, uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're gonna get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yeah. These are identical. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago, and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. And the detective tells him, you know, Russ, we've actually got a search warrant, and uh, it's happening at your brand new home with your wife there. So, are we going to find anything there? And Rusty is very quiet. He's thinking about that question. Russell's only concern is his wife, Mary Elizabeth. He just got her her dream home. Her floors were gorgeous. She got a brand new piano. And he's thinking... She's having to go through all this nonsense. Why? He wants to minimize the effect that it's going to have on his wife. And the detective promises, you know, we're going to do everything that we can do to minimize the impact on her. However, we do have people there now and they are searching much like they did with Larry. And he asks the detective, how can we minimize the impact on Mary Elizabeth? And Jim Smith replies very casually. <laughs> well, you start with the truth. That's fine. Now let's get back to the issue. What's that? So you talk about perception. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah and the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. Where do we go? Russ, is there anything you want from me? Is there anything you want me to explain? Is there something missing that you're struggling with that I can shed some light on for you? I'm struggling with how upset my wife is right now. Russ, what are you looking for? I'm concerned that they're tearing apart my wife's brand new house. So am I. But if nobody tells them what's there and what's not, they don't have any choice. Computers will be brought to Microsoft in California. They'll be, they'll be picked apart. You can't erase things from computers. It doesn't happen. I'm sure you've seen that. I'm sure that's pretty common knowledge these days. It just doesn't happen. There's, they sell programs that uh, to try and help people clean their computers of stuff, and our guys are pulling that stuff out all the time. The FBI is pulling that stuff out all the time. This investigation will end up costing no less than $10 million. 
easy. And they will say no to nothing. Any request this major case manager makes on this case, they've already been told it's approved. Don't even bother asking. So as I said, Detective Jim Smith is a brilliant interrogator. He picked up right away on the fact that Russell's concern was his wife's new house. Of course, the military as well. But Russell really did not want to upset Mary Elizabeth. So not only does he confess, but he draws them a map of where everything is. And we went over previously how in college he was very organized. I mean, it's probably how he rose up so quickly in the military, being disciplined, organized. These are some photos of how he cataloged the underwear, where he kept some of the tapes from his camcorder. They were hidden right in his homes right where his wife could find them if she had looked. And it's unbelievable how calm he is, how nonchalant he is while explaining where these things are. No problem. Here you go. I don't know. I almost felt as though he felt they wouldn't figure it out, right? But when he knew that they had figured it out, there was no emotion. It was just like, oh, okay, yeah, you figured it out. Okay, so here's everything and I'm going to prison. Bye, career. Bye, Mary Elizabeth. Bye, Rosebud, the cat. Just, okay. Now, the court case does end up happening. But again, I'm going to leave the full interrogation for you to watch. I got this from the mob reporter, but the interrogation is all over uh, the internet. You can find it all over YouTube. Uh, I, I encourage you to go and listen to this and maybe even to get the books about this case because it, it fascinated me for well over a year that a man of his stature with a normal life, completely normal life, wonderful wife, great neighbors, stellar career, could do the things that he did. And what led him to the young girls, you know, let's keep that part in mind as well. The 12 year old girl, Samantha, wrote the paper about Russell how greatly she admired him. He was going to let his friend Larry, <laughs> his neighbor, go down for this with no problem whatsoever. And Larry is quite confident that he would have been in prison had they not caught Russell because they weren't really letting up the pressure. They wanted to know who was doing this. In total, there were 82 crimes, 82 break-ins. That is unbelievable. So the colonel's day would look like getting up super early and driving out to the base and working all day and sometimes flying, flying people and meeting people like the queen. You know, he's meeting the queen and coming home to Tweed, changing. I'm sure, out of his uniforms and doing his jogging. And in those jogs is where he was breaking into homes in the middle of the night and doing the things that he was doing. It's absolutely shocking to me. And I know in part one, when we were all chatting in the chat, people were thinking maybe a homeless person because he smelled dirty. You know, who knew? Who knew? but it is the most regarded man on Cozy Cove. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this. I enjoyed telling you. Uh, it, again, has been a story that I've been obsessed with. I hope I did justice to the victims by telling you more about them than focusing on him. He is not the one who needs to be remembered in all of this. He is quite a character, yes. But there was Jane and Samantha and the 11-year-old twins and Anne Marsan and Jessica Lloyd and Marie France and, you know, the ladies who live there, Lori, the ones who were scared, the 15-year-old girl who could no longer sleep in her bedroom. So keep them in mind while these crazy people are fascinating. The victims deserve the story. They deserve the story. So off to start researching for the next one. I thank you guys so much for tuning in. You're so appreciated. And I will see you soon. Bye. This was to Jessica's mother. You won't believe me, I know, but I am sorry for having taken your daughter from you. Jessica was a beautiful, gentle young woman, as you know. I know she loved you very much. She told me so again and again. I can tell you that she did not suspect the end was coming. Jessica was happy because she believed she was going home. I know you have already had what looks like a lot of pain in your life. I am sorry to have caused you so much more. Russ Williams. Written to Marie's father. Dear Mr. Camo, I am sorry for having taken your daughter Marie France from you. I know you won't be able to believe me, but it's true. Marie France has been deeply missed by all that knew her. Signed, Russ Williams. And finally to the wife that he was so worried about. Dearest Mary Elizabeth, I love you, sweet. I am so very sorry for having hurt you like this. I know you'll take good care of sweet Rosie.